Hey all, and welcome to another LR watch repair video. This time we're actually doing a real wristwatch. As you can see it is a rotary mechanically driven watch and this watch is actually working. Now when I went to a shop in Stirling a few weeks ago to buy some other watches, I bought some pocket watches and things to work on, he uh, asked me if I wanted to take this. I says, how much do you want for it? And he said nothing, so that was good enough for me. So unfortunately this is going to become a tool to learn on. Now I'm going to be straight up from the start. Yes, it is working. It seems to be working absolutely fine. All the hands are free. The second seems to keep good time, but you've got to start learning somewhere. So I'd rather start learning on something that I know actually works rather than something that's broken so I can guarantee for a fact whether I'm actually repairing it or not. Now the actual date set on this watch is quite an inventive mechanism. If you look, you pull the pusher out to move the hands around and you actually push it in to make it go and then push it in further than that and it's spring loaded and it will advance the day. Now this particular watch is on a nice little, well I say it's gold plated, it's not actually gold plated of course. Frankly I think it looked horrible. But that's what it came on and uh, <laughs> that's what we're going to go with. Like I say this is a very inexpensive watch and it is going to bear the brunt of my self-education. So, going in there, lovers of rotary watches, you might want to turn off, because I am very sorry. So, first and foremost, let's get the um, get the old bracelet off. I say it's horrible, what I mean by that is it's not to my taste, of course. There might be people out there that love it. For me, I like just, just a standard plain stainless strap. That'll, that'll do for me, or bracelets, I suppose is known in the industry, but the good news is that this one is coming off fairly easily. I did actually try to do some um, background research of this particular rotary watch, and unfortunately it all came to naught. No matter where I looked, where I tried, I simply could not find any information regarding this watch. So I don't know how old it is, I've got no idea even roughly what year it's from, the bracelet tells us nothing, the serial numbers tell us nothing, and there's nothing on the inside of it, as we are about to see. I tried every Google page I could find, every Wikipedia page I could find, I also tried Reddit, and it all came up to naught. So if you know what this is, please do let us know, and let me know I'm not destroying some sort of priceless invaluable watch. Now, the screw back on this was actually loose coming into this, which is always going to sort of fill you with confidence for the upcoming event, if you will. So, first things first, we're going to need to take out that silicon o-ring. And then it's got these two little screw tabs um, to remove it, to remove the workings from the actual watch case. But first off, we need to remove the winder. You see, that's just that little screw at the bottom there, which releases that winder. Now... Often there's a little spring detent, I know inside my Amiga it's a spring detent and inside an upcoming Seiko it's a spring detent, but this one's a nice little screw. It's all in good taking it out but putting it back together is a bit of a pain in the arse. So once those two catches have been rotated, you can actually just rotate the watch in as slightly and then it just falls out. And there you go, those are the workings fresh out of the watch. Quite a nice little mechanism to remove it, I don't mind telling you that neither. So first things first, let's look at getting these handles off. I don't know if you'd noticed that second hand, but it was actually mildly mangled. And I don't know how that can happen unless someone's already been in the back of this and had a play. In which case I don't feel quite so bad. So we've got these nice little pry levers and indeed this small amount of plastic over the front. I was told that that's natural bona fide genuine piece of plastic specifically to do that but frankly I don't buy it sorry Luke so that's the handles off and it's always good to put these to one side now this is the first ever wristwatch that I've opened and again I'm I'm still very much learning this hobby so please take what I do with a pinch of salt this is not a, a guide of how to do it in fact you're probably watching this for your own morbid curiosity it's like when you well, when you see a car crash happening in front of your own eyes, you just can't help but look away. And I feel like this is probably going to be one of those cases. 
But anyway, back to the watch. So the face itself, it's got two pins on the rear of the face and it's got two screws retaining the face to the actual chassis of the watch. So by undoing these pair of screws, the face should be just about ready to come off. So the face of this watch is in actually quite remarkable condition if it has been open. There you go, that's straight off and now you've got a lovely, lovely view to the front side of the watch. So it's straight off, that doesn't need any work at all, that's that's quite good just to chuck to one side and um, leave it there really. So now what we've got is the date wheel there. We've also got what looks like a cannon pinion. And we've also got some new dials which I'm not used to looking at which I'm assuming are to do with the date set mechanism. This is the first time I've looked at a date set mechanism. So what I'm trying to do here is just try and figure out the way to do it. You can see we've got a spring detent on the left, got some sort of cannon pinion in the centre, but first we've got to remove that wheel there. There we go, that's where you can see we've got a, a little bit of a top hat effect on the back of that and now we're, we're on to actually removing this central plate. So I don't know what that plate does, but by removing the screws from it, I'm oh sorry we're not actually on the plate at all, I'm lying to you completely, we're on this spring detent, it's very difficult to see, I probably should invest in some better camera equipment if I'm to keep doing this, but there we are. And with those removed we can gain access to this cannon pinion with a thrust washer on which we're very much used to seeing from the pocket watches. So the difference between a watch like this and a pocket watch is all a sense of scale although it looks like there's a lot more to it and indeed there is a lot more to it in essence they are one and the same you know you've got a you've got a big spring going down a train of wheels to a release wheel with a pallet fault and a balance wheel it's all the same stuff, just there's more stuff added on, which is one of the best things about watchmaking. The additions are all called complications, and I just have the vision of a uh, horologist or a watchmaker somewhere sat moaning about the fact he's having to deal with these brand new complications to his job, which he'd been doing for 60 or so years before. Something I noticed with this watch as I was dissembling it is it seemed that a lot of the screws were done up incredibly tightly. I don't know why but when you get something small like this I wouldn't imagine that the well any fitting on it would be done up particularly tightly but um, lo and behold every single one took about about three white knuckles to to get it undone which I find to be baffling and by removing the central cover plate we gain access to well just about everything now you can see we've got this Again, I'm I'm woefully under-equipped because I don't know any of the names of these parts. But they're all different types of pallets and pushes and pivots. and It is all quite fascinating, really, how they can cram so much technology into this small package. And it's, again, even more fascinating that all of this is run by a single spring. Brilliant thing with these old mechanical watches, no matter what you have on them, what complications they have, whether it be date, day, chronographs, even ones I've got alarms on them, they're all ultimately powered by one main spring, as indeed it's called the main spring. I was very lucky there, as you can see, there's a there's an index detent for the uh, date wheel there, and as you see, I knocked it, and it actually become detached itself, and I was very, very fortunate that the spring hadn't gone flying or it had gone flying, but it hadn't gone flying too much, you know what I mean? It's another thing I've noticed, the difference between a wristwatch and a pocket watch. It seems that wristwatches are absolutely jam-packed full of springs, they just can't get enough of them. And here you can see we're on a zoomed in view of me trying to release that particular spring without it sending itself into next week.
So here you can see we've got some sort of bridge which I'm working on at the moment in the centre and I can only assume that they are covering what is known as the motion works. Now the motion works are what actually make the hands go round. So there's a series of cogs which the hands of the watch actually friction fit onto and even if it's coming through the watch or if you're hand winding it to set the time they have to enact on the motion works and I believe that is what I've just took out there and this particular little sprocket took me completely by surprise it's in a very novel fitting which I haven't seen before so you can see it's finally come up so underneath it it's actually held in in an almost semicircular sort of D cutout with some spring tension on it but the spring actually seems to be set into the chassis of the watch you can see that's what I'm trying to do there I'm playing with it in an attempt to try and remove it or indeed I was I just simply cannot get it to go so in it remains so here we're moving over to the keyless works of the watch and first off we've got this again another spring on another plate which is actually putting tension on the crown and the stem and the puller etc and you can see it's sprung loaded because it's just tried to fire itself out it's a fascinating phrase keyless works in the same way as if someone goes to prison for a life sentence it's not for their life it is life as opposed to death and that's the same story with the keyless works it's called a keyless works because it's keyless as opposed to just to cut myself off look at that <laughs> sprung loaded absolutely fantastic i was very glad that um no matter how many things sprung themselves off when i was disconnecting this um i did manage to get it all back you can see the spring there is actually just over the just over the barrel there it is apologies anyway so um keyless works as opposed to keyed works because in the early early days of pocket watches you had to wind them up with a key so when the first pocket watches came out which didn't require a key they had a keyless works and that's the same terminology and phrasing which has been transferred from pocket watches to wrist watches and I just think that's absolutely fascinating and there you can see the keyless works basically just pouring out all over the workbench <laughs> again luckily nothing was lost so continuing with the removal of this we've got um, this sprung loaded section here and I did have the correct name for this and it was just on the tip of my tongue and now it's completely evaporated unfortunately but this basically puts tension on the main barrel of the keyless works so when you are winding it and you pull the crown back it allows the ratcheting effect to come over. So turning over the watch we're now going to remove that final screw which as I was saying that's what clamps down onto the stem to prevent it from falling out altogether. So by undoing that screw fully that's released that little, that little mechanism and you can see that that screw does not want to go through there whatsoever. I'm just coming back to have another go at that spring which on the chassis but I can assure you from the future proofing point of view that it's not going to come out. So here we are on the actual mechanism of the watch. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to remove the balance wheel. Now the balance wheel is obviously an incredibly sensitive piece on the construction or deconstruction of a watch with the hairspring on the side of it so called because it's the thickness of a human hair if you pinch that or crimp it, it's good night Vienna. It, it's all over. It's completely knackered. So it's always best to try and remove that where possible. You can see we know we're on a rotary watch because of that printing there. And what I'm trying to do here is let down the mainspring. We know that it's working. We know that it had tension in the mainspring. And if I undo any of this whilst there's tension in the mainspring, it's all going to fire out. So what I'm doing is I'm just holding off the click, which is that piece at the top, it's effectively the fall of the ratchet and I'm just allowing that main wheel to slip between my fingers. In reality I could have put the stem back in and I could have held it on the stem and undone it. That would have the exact same effect but I did okay doing it like this. And with this I can undo the screw which removes this, I suppose you'd call it a first drive sprocket from the mainspring. So there we can see 
the logo screen printed onto that first drive wheel with the winged wheel on there. And apparently that was first introduced in 1925 and it has been the exact same ever since. So that logo is nearly 100 years old and it's still used on watches today. Of course I don't know how old this watch is, but regardless it's still about 100 years old. So with the click off I can now remove the click spring. I was very happy with how easily that came off. It didn't pop any fight whatsoever. So this second wheel, you'll notice there's something slightly wrong here. It's actually a left-handed thread. So what's meant by that is, instead of being righty-tighty and lefty-loosey, it's righty-loosey righty -loosey and lefty-tighty, just to be <laughs> thoroughly upsetting. Now, I sort of knew that this was going to be like this, just from videos I've seen and advice that I've had, so I went in on the proposal that it could be a backwards thread. And it's always worth having that in the back of your head because at the end of the day, you can be trying to undo it and undo it and undo it, and eventually it'll just shear the head of the screw clear off, and then again, it's good night, Vienna. So you'll notice as I'm taking off this bridge, there's a part I missed on that secondary wheel. There was actually a very, very small spacer underneath it. I'm very glad I noticed. Otherwise it would have fallen off and it would have never gone back together properly. And I suppose you've just seen what I've got there. There's lots of tiny, tiny mixing pots that I used to have for a, uh, another hobby. And what I'm doing is as I'm taking off a level of the watch, so taking off the bridge and everything underneath it, I'm keeping it all separate in these little pots. And that's in an effort to try and help me put it back together. So with the bridge off, we're onto the trainer wheels. This one is the minute wheel. So that is the long thin stem which runs through the centre of the chassis of the watch and comes out which the minute hand stabs onto. And now I'm sure there are proper names for these wheels but all I can tell you is that they are the drive wheels at this point. Again as I go on and I get more and more involved in this I will really endeavour to learn the proper names for these things rather than just the wheel or the spring. <laughs> I do know this particular one is the escapement. We'll get that sent off as well. And with this screw, we should be removing the pallet fork bridge, and then we should be removing the pallet fork. Again, some of these are a little stiff, so they require just a small amount of screwdriver underneath to try and pull them up. These are actually pinned on the bridges themselves and then it looks like it's just a, a hole through it but it isn't it actually slits onto a dowel first and then the screw just sort of retains it down and let's try and make sure that when the bridge goes down to the chassis it's hit quite accurately which I'm quite impressed about one thing I'm impressed about is the incredibly inexpensive watch we all know it's going to be an inexpensive watch but it's still I think it's a 17 dual movement so that's quite impressive really to have all the all the jaws and I suppose if you can't see now and you're going to see soon there's a bridge over the main the main drum there, the main the main drive spring. And even that has got a jewel on it. And apparently that's quite a uh, quite a revered thing. And it's just fascinating that they've managed to make it that cost effective and still got this amount of technology inside. Just makes you wonder how they can how they can make it so cheap. With the screws out of that, I say with the screws out of it, they're not quite out yet. So that screw's not actually to do with the um, that barrel bridge, sorry. That's actually one of the case hold down screws, but I just felt like it was time to remove it, so out she went. And these now are the two screws for the main barrel bridge, which then should just remove itself quite easily to gain us access to the barrel which I've since learned is the term for all the combined units for that main spring so it's the case in which it's in it's the top plate it's the arbor in the center or anvil as a, a subscriber recently told me um, they call it I don't really know the correct term for it I've heard anvil and arbor but with it removed regardless that is the chassis of the watch empty 
and safety squint engaged. <laughs> Brilliant. I've never seen that happen in the videos, have you? I was quite fortunate though, although it sprung itself to bits, it sprung itself into four large enough bits to find. It only took about 15 minutes to find that arbor, and no, it wasn't lodged in the artex in the ceiling. So what I'm doing here is I'm just attaching the balance wheel back to the sh chassis of the watch. As I said, it's that sensitive and that frail, the last thing I want to do is cause any damage. So you see, I'm just attaching it back to the chassis of the watch to make sure that it isn't going to succumb to any damage in the long run. Here are the parts <laughs> for that barrel. So with the workings of the watch assembled, it's time just to crack on with the actual watch case itself. Now this is a acrylic crystal and you can see it's popped out. It's actually retained this little indicator dial on the inside and I'm led to believe that this is to aid with waterproofing. So these discs, if you see them on the inside of an acrylic crystal, it's so when you press it in it's actually putting active pressure on the crystal against the inside of that watch casing. So hopefully it should make it less likely water can get inside. Now, there's not been any evidence of water getting inside this watch, but I still find it interesting all the same. So with that removed, that should be the whole watch dissembled. And I'm just showing you off the crystal here because it's actually in quite good condition. So I don't actually think I did anything with it. I just give it a bit of a the old standard NATO toothpaste polish and that was it. It was uh, all good to go. So for the cleaning of this watch, after last time's event where everything went down the pan in the ultrasonic cleaner, I'm going back to, back to what I know and I was actually resting everything in 99% alcohol there. And you can see the staggering difference in all the different colours was to do with the amount of oil it pulled off. So the watch clean, it's time to get it reassembled. First things first, before it decides to sod off again, I'm going to get the mainspring put back inside the barrel. Now before it does that, I'm just going to give it some lubrication. Now this isn't an automatic watch, it's going to go in and be fine, but it's got a little detent against it, so I should be able to wind this in by hand, and indeed I'm going to. It's a little bit more complex than the pocket watch springs, the carbon springs, I'll grant you. It's a little bit longer, plus it's one of the S-Bend springs, so it's got a lot more tension to it. But with a small amount of patience, I'm winding it, you know, thumb by thumb, side by side. There is absolutely no reason why I shouldn't be able to put this in, and you can tell that I'm actually managing to do that pretty okay about now. Most people you see doing this, making a bit more of a proper job of it, they've got um, a handy little rewind tool, which is quite fantastic. You, you wind it up and it puts it into a little casing, just smaller than that barrel. And then you've got a syringe plunger and it'll plunge it in and it'll expand to fill up that barrel. And it makes a very satisfying click noise as well, I have to say. But regardless, the oranges have got upstairs and the anvil is going in, or rather, depending on who you are and where you're from. So I'm just indicating there that it really is sealed. Now, again, you can get a, a lovely little plastic tool to click these in, but with a bit of common sense, you should be able to do it by hand. Now you see it's got a return one side and that side's at the bottom. And what I'm doing here is I'm just lining it all up, I'm pushing it in by hand, and it's a very satisfying click in your fingers. And it's all on, and there you go, that's our reassembled barrel. So first things first, we need to get the chassis of the watch back to a position where we can reassemble it. So we are going to remove this balance wheel, or the balance bridge for the balance wheel, I suppose. Again, acquiring a very, very subtle pry off the old screwdriver just to try and get it lifted off those dowels. And that's it removed. So now we're stripped to bare bones. Let's get it put back together. So we took this side apart last. So we're putting this back apart first. 
And there you go, that's a very clear view of that crystal inside the uh, the main barrel bridge now, look, you see. So what I'm doing is I'm pushing down the bridge, making sure the wheel spins, and I'm tightening up the screws in, per, in, in time, so one side, then the other, I'm not cinching one right down and then doing it. And I'm just giving that that barrel just a little bit of a spin afterwards just to make sure it works. And here we are, we're going to crack on with the with the escapement, so that's the escape wheel, and then we're going to build it back to that barrel. Again, if there's a better way of doing this, or you may think there's a better way of doing this, please do feel free to let me know, because I'm not going to lie to you, I'm just some guy playing about with this, and you know, there are many ways to skin a cat, and I'm sure there's many ways better than mine. So here I am uh, assembling the, the trainer wheels. You can see I've actually put that together, I end up actually having to remove that second wheel that I put on, just to get me a little bit more access to, to put this back on. Now again, it's presenting me some very, very small amount of difficulties. It's always worth making sure that these things align properly, because ultimately, if they don't, when you try and tighten down the bridges, you're either going to bend and snap the pivots or you're going to shatter one of the jewels and then, well, and then no one wants to be in the situation really, do they? So the final one to go in is the minute wheel and you might be wondering what's going on here. I can tell you what's going on here. <laughs> um, I'm trying to put in the minute wheel and it's trying to go through the other side and it's getting stuck against my gel cushion, which is why we are now switching over to this small orange plated thing that I have just to make sure that it can actually get through and basically not foul. And with that in place, we can get the power bridge put on. Now it's a little bit of toing and froing and backing and forth and just to make sure it's all lined up and you know, pressing around. You can see it actually dropped on there, which was quite handy. One thing you can do is you can put a very small amount of tension on the bridge itself and then whilst you're holding the tension on it what you can do is spin the wheels or spin the drive wheel anyway. By the drive wheel I mean the, the barrel if you will. And that should get you to a position where it should all fall together and then you're quite handy and able just to drop the screws on and then you're good to go. That is one thing I've noticed with this wristwatch especially is already much easier on the bridge front than the old pocket watches were. They were a nightmare trying to get everything all lined up. So with that bridge in place, we're going to drop that spacer back on. And we're going to drop this second wheel in this sort of idler wheel. And I've actually got the proper lubricants now. So this is a proper Mobius oil going in with an actual applicator on the high friction area there to make sure that it doesn't cause any damage basically. And again, watch out for the sneaky backwards thread. That will come up and it will bite you and you will come a cropper on that. Which frankly is what nobody wants. But you can see it's lubricated and what I'm doing is I'm just giving it a bit of a spin round now to make sure that it's fully seated and there's nothing pinching and we're all good to go. So I actually fought with this click, sp click spring trying to assemble it a lot. Um, I, <laughs> but I put the, the spring in first and then I was trying to get the cling on, cling on? The click on afterwards and frankly that wasn't working for anybody because it just didn't want to go. So what I found was perhaps the best thing to do was, I just did it there, I actually put the click on first and then I snuck the spring underneath it and then I made it fit at the bottom afterwards and that seemed to be the best way to do it. And with that on, obviously I'm going to keep constant pressure on it because I don't trust myself to not knock that spring off and send it flying. But now it's on, I can put on this lovely monogrammed sprocket and that should retain that click spring.
So with that, we're going to drop the screw in place. And we should be about there on that side. Now, obviously, there's a couple other things that we need to do. We need to get the pallet fork put on. And, of course, we also need to get the, um, the balance wheel put on there. But we're not going to do that just yet. And the reason we're not going to do that is because I quite like the noise it makes there. So turning the watch over, and this is the, the business end of things. This is what's going to turn this bit of clockwork into an actual watch. And here we're going to put the keyless work back in first. So you can see there's a couple of different parts which make up the keyless works. And I'm sure you can also see that I put that sneaky lever back in first because frankly, it's a pain in the ass. So here we are, I'm putting in the, the stem and the winder and that is just to try and help me line things up. It's trying to keep the um, keyless works in and all I'm doing is I've, I've put it in, I'm going to do up that screw just to make sure that it stays in place and that will also allow me to test all of the functions of the movement as they're doing. So I believe I've remembered now, I believe that is called the yoke which is going in, which is that spring to cover that item there. And that is actually the spring for when you're pushing down. That's just gone in there at the top. So when you push down, that's what returns the pusher back to its original position. And again, we're just going to go with a little bit of oil on that third idle wheel down the bottom there, which is all part of the time setting works. There's a lot happening in a very small amount of time here. I'm trying to keep up. So. so again, we've got the proper oils now. So now these are in. That's a very high friction area. So we're going to be going in with some synthetic silicon grease, which is a lovely, lovely blue colour. So I believe this is the yoke going in, which is what's enacted upon that barrel for the keyless work so as you push it in and out and in and out it's it's an acting on the uh, on the yoke there mm -hmm. and as you might well imagine of course that yoke has got a spring <laughs> called the yoke spring and frankly there is absolutely no need to make them this <laughs> no need to make them as stiff as they are but um there's some sadistic fucker out there who wants to so here we are wish me luck i found the best way to do it is get one end of them in and then just pull it over. Oh, God. <laughs> and just pull it over and eventually it should fall in. And, yeah, there you go. So that's in. And then I'm just going to give it a nice good old push. And then I'm going to, frankly, act as if I'm disposing a bomb when I put the second plate on with its, with its click. Because that is going to cover over that yoke spring and make sure it doesn't fly out. So that's why we're going for that one next. <clears throat> so one thing which plagued me here, which is a comment that was made in my previous video um, is that I was using screwdrivers which had become magnetic. Now, these were not magnetic screwdrivers when when they were new. They were not sold as magnetic screwdrivers. But it seems like screwdrivers have the ability to gain magnetism. So what I need to buy is a, it's like a block, a degausser we'd call it. Um, and it's what you can buy to actually make screwdrivers magnetic, but it's also got a portion to remove the magnetism or to de-gauss them, which is very useful for me. So here we've got a new view, all zoomed in. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to grease the rest of these very high friction parts. So I've been working on the camera work for this video specifically, and this is a new view which allows me to get much more zoomed and also, I don't know if you've noticed, but the autofocus issue has been remedied. But because of that, it's um, also removed the stabilisation. 
Now, I don't currently have a way around that, so you'll have to let me know what you prefer. A shaky camera where I can get this lovely zoomed in view and where I'm not auto focusing out to my knuckles, hair as they are, every five minutes. Or tell me if you want to see some knuckle just because you can't be dealing with the shaking so much. That's one of the strangest sentences I've said today. So there I am, look, you can see I'm just playing with the stem and the old watch, just making sure that everything's lubricated where it needs to be. And I think there's a requirement for just a little bit more because that is part of the date set works. And I'm sure you can see that when I push it in, it actually gets pushed out. So that will be a steel on steel contact point. Now the lubrication's actually a bit of a dual purpose affair. As well as making it easier to operate, what it's also going to do is remove the wear, which is you know kind of an obvious thing. But where it comes in for us as watchmakers, us as watchmakers, you heard this guy, um, is it prevents the material from breaking down and creating swarf and bits of steel which can then float around inside the workings of the watch and destroy it. So it's sort of a, a dual purpose affair, which is another reason you want to get watches serviced regularly, because that always happens, but the worn down bits of watch actually get captured within the grease. So it's good because it stops from falling into the watch. Then what actually creates is a like a pumice paste or a polishing compound and it'll basically cause those metallic parts to wear out much quicker. So that's why you want to get things serviced. Those pesky screws. So rotary watches have always been a bit of a name. I've always known the name rotary watches. In fact, my cousin bought me a rotary watch for my uh, 21st birthday. God love him. And I wondered why it was such a thing in in Britain especially. And I was actually able to do some looking up on the rock watch brand itself. Now, they were established in 1895 in Switzerland. So they are a genuine Swiss watch. Um, and then in the 20s, there was this family called the Dreyfus or the Dreyfuses who had started selling these watches and exporting them to Britain. And it actually became one of the most successful markets for the watch. So there you can see I'm just giving that bit of a bit of a lubricate as well because it's a steel on steel part. So they were an incredibly successful watch in the British market. Now in the 20s they remained and as I said before the uh, rotary logo was introduced in 25. And they stayed there, just gaining more and more wealth until eventually they were adopted by the British Army. So if you were in the British Army, chances were that you were going to have a rotary watch. And even if you didn't, you'd certainly um, you'd certainly know the name. And then all of a sudden, round about 1940, the Second World War broke out. Now, without getting into the, the details of that, it meant swathes and swathes of people were getting drafted into the British Army. So more and more people getting drafted to the Army, more and more watches being made. And because of that, there was rotary watches in almost every household in Britain, and that is how they became such a popular name. So in 2006, rotary watches were elected as one of the UK's super brands and has retained its place all the time while it's being incredibly cost effective. And as you can see, they're actually very high quality as well, really, for what they are anyway. So as I mentioned, they were produced by the, the Dreyfuses or uh, the Dreyfi, and these people still make watches. Um, they make more exclusive watches, um, under the name Dreyfus and Co. And I don't really have lots of information about them, but I do know that they are that's sort of the more the more high end version of them. So it is still a Swiss made watch and they are still sold in the UK and the head office in the UK, but it is now a wholly Chinese-owned company, 
as is the same with a, a lot of things like this. So as you can see, I've, I've glossed over quite a lot of the quite a lot of the commentary here, as this watch has been flying back together. I hope you've been I hope you've been keeping up with what's been happening, because um, frankly, I don't know if I could explain it or not. <laughs> so what I'm putting in here is a another spring mechanism for the data just and again it all, all links in together so we're going to get that screwed up and then we're going to have to get it greased as well because there is another steel on steel surface so one thing which is not mentioned on this watch Ah, that's a, a lovely view of how the data just works. So one thing that's not mentioned on this rotary watch is it being a dolphin standard. Now you know how watchmakers have all their their own terms like um, Rolex for instance they've got an oyster perpetual. An oyster refers to the fact that it's um, able to go underwater and the perpetual refers to the fact that it's an automatic um, but this rotary watch has a no dolphin standard, but the rotary does have that term, and what it's referring to is the fact it's uh, able to go underwater or it's water resistant. And they suggest it could be suitable for all day swimming and diving, but frankly, I wouldn't trust it. And such is the way with a lot of uh, the work I do on watches, I'd put that piece in, got it all lubricated, I was just happy with it, and then I realised actually, you pillock, you've got to remove that <laughs> because uh, you've got to get the old can and pinion chuck back on there, as indeed I have done. I was quite happy with this cannon pinion that it wasn't a friction fit as they so often are because I still don't have a cannon pinion removal tool which is a tool which grips onto the outside and puts a nice equal pressure around it to pull it off concentrically and linearly to make sure it actually comes off and doesn't bend anything. I mean you can get it off with tweezers but you just got to be that extra bit of careful. And you can see with that reassembled it's all gone on just fine. So one thing I've got to comment on here at this point especially not my uh, over lubrication removal with Rodico is that poor old date dial. I'm sure you've noticed it's suffered some damage and unfortunately that was my fault. So with cleaning it I'd cleaned it in basically too strong of a solution. Um, it was in the it was in the alcohol and some of the numbers simply floated off. <laughs> um, and it's curious because I did I did test it on a, a bit on the underside and you couldn't tell anything. And I tested it in between the letters and nothing happened, but it seems that where the numbers are, they are quite susceptible to uh, the alcohol. But again, any time I damage something, it's just a lesson learned. It's another way to not do something. And here we are now at the business end of things once more, trying, trying very desperately <laughs> to get this pallet fork dropped back in. So... These actually sit on their pivots. What I mean by that is if the pivot isn't in, it will drop onto the tip of the pallet fork. So what I've learned is best to do is to try and get that bottom side in the jewel and then pick up the pallet fork bridge as I'm doing here and try and drop the jewel over the pivot and then try and focus on getting it landed. So you can see I'm actually going to try and pick the pivot up with the jewel. It's not quite working for me just yet. Oh, it's dropped in there. And because it's dropped in there, I've left that a little bit high and I'm trying to get it all picked up. And eventually it'll go and you can tie it up with a screw. And it's time to test to make sure it works. It's already a good start because I'm able to tear, put some wind into it. If that wasn't connected properly, I'd be winding it and the work should just keep spinning round and round and round. So with a little bit of tension put on that mainspring lovely you can see that pallet fork is just going to snap back and forth and back and forth and that means that the power has gone through all the train of wheels and is sitting on that pallet fork properly which means it should be ready to put the balance wheel and the balance wheel bridge on and then as you see so often it should just spring into life now this is a very very exciting moment for me and um, we're as exciting as you're going to get because it's just Oh, it took forever and I've cut a bit of it out because it took bloody ages and you see it's trying to go it's trying to go there <laughs> there it goes there it goes absolutely brilliantly and oh it stopped 
<laughs> and yes, don't count your chickens before they've hatched. What I did there is I'd uh, I'd put the the balance on, and that balance bridge wasn't seated properly against the chassis of the watch, which allowed the the nose of it, where that shock setting was, to actually grip onto the the pivot for the balance wheel, and stop it from running. Luckily, no damage was done. As I say, I wasn't really giving it grim death, but it was just enough to stop it. And now you can see I can put a proper wind in the watch, and she's she's running a bloody kipper. Now, I don't know if you saw on the front of the watch, it's had the phrase Inca block. And now that we've zoomed in to lubricate these jewels, I'm going to explain what an Inca block is. An Inca block is another term for a shock setting. And that is that caged jewel on the left at the top of the pivot for the balance staff. Now, what is an Inca block, you might ask? What is a shock setting, you might ask? It is a jewel which is held in a spring basically, so it gives you a little bit of movement. In old pocket watches, if you were to ever drop them, you can guarantee you're going to do some damage. Now, you might think that's obvious, you're going to bend the case, but it's not that we're talking about. If you were to drop an old pocket watch, chances were you would snap the pivot for that balance staff which is spinning round, or you'd damage it, or you'd do some sort of some sort of irreparable in, in, irreparable harm. And I have to laugh at myself here. God loves someone who tries. <laughs> so they came up with this, the shock setting. Now these were on some very old watches. And this is the first one I'd ever done. Now don't let this don't let this fool you. That is probably only about two or three more wide. And I'm going to remove it. And you can see what it is. It is a teeny tiny little cage holding in a shock setting. And that cage acts like a spring. So if you were to drop it or move it around, it's on your wrist, it's going to be moving around more than a pocket watch. It effectively allows just a small amount of give to allow that shock setting to move. And there you go. You can see now that I'm going to remove that shock setting with a bit of Rodico. And that is the, that's the balance staff floating around on the inside. So what you do with these is you take them out and you clean them up. And now you can see I've got a single drop of oil on there. And these are a two-part, it's a split device. And you can see that top I'm going to pick up and drop it on there to effectively make just a drop of oil for the balance staff to rotate in. And that is going to be held together just by the surface tension of that oil. I should probably stop working on paper towel like this because it's very, very difficult to pick something up. But in the same way you get a journal on a, on a uh, turbo bearing or something like that. And you can see I've dropped it in, I've completely missed like an absolute burk. But eventually I'll get it right. Uh, <laughs> I'm embarrassing sometimes. Anyway, in the same way you get a turbo shaft spinning in a journal of oil, you get a, a balance staff here spinning in a journal of oil to effectively make it completely frictionless. So these jewels I said before, they're, they're hard as woodpecker lips, you know, you're gonna you're gonna struggle to get anything harder. Where diamond is a ten, these these jewels would be a nine and the steel of the shaft would be about a six or a seven. So these jewels are hard, but because they're hard, you can take oil to them and effectively create a fantastic bearing surface. And that's exactly what we're interested in doing here. Now you can see it's just as easy as it came out. This type in particular, I very much enjoy. I have seen some other ones which you've got to rotate and remove them. And frankly, they look like a nightmare. So I'm glad that we've got these here. And now you can see we are doing the shock setting on the other side. There are indeed some other jewels to lubricate. I can't remember if I'll show you these or not, but they were lubricated. And you've also got a nice little um, nice little close for that damaged date wheel, thanks to me cleaning things improperly. So another comment that was made against um, one of my old videos, and a very appreciated comment, was it's not a good idea to put a pallet fork in an ultrasonic cleaner. Now, your, the reason that was given is that it shouldn't go in the ultrasonic cleaner because there is a shellac which holds on the uh, which holds on the jewels of the pallet fork and it could cause the jewels to come off which would um well it yeah, would ruin your day really wouldn't it <laughs> and i can kind of see why you know it is uh, it's quite a strong it's a non-abrasive cleaner of course it is but it is quite a strong vibration that it's going to send through this so it's probably for the best no, you don't do it. And I never gave 
Field sonically and enough credit. I thought it was actually very, very mild, but as we're going to find out later in the video, mild is not a thing that it is. <laughs> it's actually uh, quite abrasive when it wants to be. So I did the exact same thing with this shock setting as the last one. Took it apart, cleaned it, new drop of oil, two halves together, and now you can see I've dropped it in there with probably just the same amount of fuss as before. And now I'm just going to drop this cage clamp back in. And it's just a little bit of a bugger. It doesn't really want to go. And now's the time to have some patience. Oh, one side's in and once one side's in, it should be, yes, there you go. Easy enough to get the other side in and that's that. So this is something that's new for me, lubricating and working on a watch like this at all, especially lubricating it with all these special Mobius lubricants. And am I going to just get another drop in there? Yes, there you go. So that's something I need to look up how to do more correctly. I already know that I should have put some on the underside of that date wheel. And I also know <laughs> that when you miss like that, it's really a good job to get it cleaned. And again, that's just a small amount of Rodico and that's just going to pull that back up again. I was once told by someone who worked on these things in the past that over lubrication is probably going to be more harmful in the long run than under lubrication. Now, I think that I have probably taken that to its very limit and I think I've under lubricated everything. But, like I say, I'm still learning. I'm just some guy playing around, you know. So, I know I should have had some under that date wheel because it is, um, I mean, it works, but it's just... Sometimes it doesn't work quite quite as good as you might like. So so that's it. It's a it's a watch again. It's all ticking and working, and we're going to chuck this face back on. And I'm going to commit a bit of an error here as I put the face back on, which uh, I'm sure you're going to see very presently. So to remove this, I uh, undid the screws, and then I basically pulled the face off so to put it back on I'm going to line up the pins of the holes and I'm going to push that face down and then I'm going to do the screws back up again and I believe this is where I am um, I met my undoing if you will because by pressing it down I actually put tension on the uh, cannon pinion which isn't too much of an issue you've got that thrust washer anyway but you also put tension on that date wheel and I think the combination of the tension from the face on that date wheel and the lack of lubrication not allowing it to float means that when I push down this pusher it's not going to move the date and there you go you see it doesn't want to work and you've got to bear in mind that this is not a strong mechanism all we're replicating here is the works from the watch and the watch needs to be able to push it around very easily as indeed it does do every single day and you can see by undoing those two screws and by lifting up the face slightly that will allow us basically to to advance the date once more as it should have been from the start so there you go so with that I'm going to it looks like I'm pushing down but I'm actually making sure I'm lifting it up before I uh, do those screws up just to make sure there's absolutely no tension on that um, on that date wheel at the time I hadn't really considered it if I'd uh, if I'd have thought at the time that I might have pinched that date wheel if I'd have thought that I should have lubricated it more then I would have taken it apart but the watch is all back together and well I'm recording this audio about five or six days after putting the watch back together and I'm happy to say that it's still working and still happy um quite how long that goes on for frankly I don't know like I say this is my first effort so we will have to see, but I was very excited that I actually managed to put it all back together, <laughs> regardless of anything else. So here we are, back with the hands, and over my previous videos, I've been working on some old watches, and every single one I've had a comment saying, take care, the dial's radioactive, watch out for the radioactive hands, and I appreciate people looking at my best interest, of course I do, and what I'm hoping is that I'm not going to get a similar comment on these hands, because one can almost guarantee that they will not have any radiation in these so unfortunately my second camera decided to not pick this up very well so we're going to have a very well 
very crap view of this, <laughs> frankly. Um, as we try and uh, put these hands back on and try and get it in a fashion where, you know, they look about right. But one thing I can say is when you put these on, it's always best to, to put them both on facing 12. So if you put the hour on at 12, then you put the minute hand over, sorry, these, yeah, the minute hand over the top of it at 12 as well, then you know that as it spins round, then you're going to be good to go. Obviously, it all needs to align up when it hits the hours and stuff, doesn't it? And that's all set inside the watch. So as long as you set them both at 12, you should be good to go. And that's what I'm doing here. You can, once you've pushed them on, just give them a little tweak back and forth. Just to make sure they're perfectly aligned. So that's one thing which I think makes or breaks a watch. The first watch I ever took apart was um, my Amiga Speedmaster Automatic. And that's one that I'd... I'd been wearing it for work, as I did, I, I bought it and I'd uh, finished my apprenticeship and I was wearing it for work and I knocked it and the hands went out of alignment. I say I knocked it, it fell off my wrist, <laughs> hit the floor from about five feet in the air and that was the only damage it sustained, so fair play really. But I opened it up just to make sure I could realign the hands because it was bothering me that much. And talking about hands, we've got one left, it's the minute hand and this is the real reason I opened the watch in the first place is to try and realign this hand. Somehow it become bent, as I say. I don't know how. All I can think is owing to the, the watch back being loose and this bent hand. I think that someone's had it open in the past. That's all I can think. So all I'm doing is I'm using a bit of Rodico here just to, just to bolster it so I'm not bending it too far, basically just to try and hold on to that little bit as I try and bend it straight so but we're very, very careful and bending it back and forth and back and forth I have got it I've got it better I wouldn't say it's perfect because frankly I don't believe it can be be made to be perfect but I've certainly got it to a point where I, I'm happier with it or that it's you know fitting for the <laughs> fitting for the rest of the watch and indeed I'm just going to continue on with this escapade of trying to get it a little bit better And with that finally done, we can get it chucked back on the watch. And that'll be the last hand to go on, and then we can look at casing up this movement. Now, this minute hand is arguably my least favourite to put on, normally because the watch is running at this point. Now, I could remove the um, move the force from that mainspring, which would stop it from spinning, but hey, everyone else can do it, so you watch, I'm going to do it as well. So, there was a jump cut just there. And that is because of the unfortunate necessity of my own foolishness. Now, this is a date set watch, of course, and what that means is that at some point that date actually clicks over. So, because of that, there becomes a time when you know it jumps over one day to the next, and I forgot to set it. So, it actually jumped from one day to the next at around about, about four in the afternoon. So, the best way to set it is to wind it until it clicks from one day to the next and then you set the two arms to be midnight and then that's that. So now that I've set that up properly what we should see is when this hour hand comes over to midnight you see that goes from 23 to 24 which is just how it wants to be. So otherwise what's the point in having a date function on it, you know? Really do with investing in one of those uh, one of those vices for or watch chassis, do you agree? So, now that we've proven every function on the watch is good to go, there's only one thing left to do, and that's to case it up. So we're going to undo this small screw, painfully, slowly. <laughs> My screwdriver is just a little bit too big for it. So we're going to undo this uh, last screw, painfully, slowly, and then that should allow us just to remove the, uh, the stem from the watch. So 
the thing with this hobby. It's brilliant because you can buy so much stuff for it. But the problem is that all this stuff makes your life so much easier. <laughs> and uh, if you don't have it, you can see uh, see why people buy it. Because you just struggle all the time. You see I can struggle with the watches, uh, struggle with the screwdrivers, struggle with the clamps. So I need to probably start investing in some more stuff. Now, you remember I said about the ultrasonic cleaner? Well, if you believe it or not, that ultrasonic cleaner, I didn't put any fluid in. No, no strict cleaner or nothing. I put in water and a bit of surfactant, basically dish soap. That's all. And even that was strong enough to rip the paint off of this lovely brass disc. And that was, I say it's brass, it might be some sort of plating. Regardless, and I was just staggered by it. So again, this disc is in there to make sure that that crystal is pinched to the watch, uh, watch case to make sure there's no access for water. Which means it's got to go in with an actual closer. So it doesn't just drop in. It's not got a bezel on it or anything, but it needs to go in on this little vice. And all this is is effectively a screw, which is just going to put additional pressure on and push it into that, uh, push it home, basically. Now, sometimes what you can do is you can put something soft on the inside, like a cork or something. And as you wind it down, it's going to reduce the diameter of the outside. Then when you put it into the watch case, you unscrew it, and it'll spring back out, filling the watch case. But that's never going to happen with this because of that... Uh, that plated section on the inside but that's um well that's it that's now back in the watch and and ticking away so what i've got to do is put the old um well the shitty bracelet back on and that'll be good to go and frankly i, I struggled more than i should have done um i blame the the new pins that i put in not being not being very high quality but uh i got there in the end and there we are at the end. Now you can see I haven't really put in much um, much effort to polish up the the casing or anything. That wasn't really the effort here. Um, you know, I've, I've polished things in the past. I'd, I'd, I'd know what I was doing with that or I'd know how to get out of issues with it. But I was mainly interested in looking at the workings. And here we are comparing it next to a real watch, which is never going to be opened, especially not by me, my lovely uh, Speedmaster Moon watch, my pride and joy. And here we are. So I really hope that you've enjoyed um, watching me well, make this very unhappy watch a little bit unhappier. Um, I hope I've not offended too many people. Please let me know in the comments below if there's anything else you'd like to see. Thank you very much.